Miria watched the rise and fall of the waves, trying to find her calm in her place. The peaceful oblivion of meditation had refused to come for days, not since she had stepped out of the Starcraft and listened to the weeping of Olan's mother as they brought his body out of the ship. Somewhere out there, the beautiful box that they had placed his ashes in was beginning to open, to dissipate, and just beyond where they had dropped that, she could still see the wreckage of her ship. Yangu had taken everything from her, and she didn't think she would know peace until she had her vengeance. She still wore Olan's scarf around her neck. Otherwise, she wore the broad sun hat, low-cut blouse, and flowing skirts of the island women. Normally, Miria had no problem wearing revealing clothes. But now? She'd seen herself in the mirror. Her skin was a patchwork of white and angry red. Fields of bright petechia, small lesions here and there. The radiation was working slow, but it was eating her from the inside. So much going on. So much to mourn. So much to plan. She lingered on the beach a moment more, hoping that perhaps her squid friend might reveal himself. Give her a moment's distraction as she tried to decipher his alien thoughts. No such luck. Curse you, Yangu. I'm going to blast you out of the sky. She turned and walked into her shack, grabbed the tools she had salvaged from the ship, and got back to work on making Rhea that new suit of armor. Reload your three-bladed sword. Get comfortable in your chainmail bikini or your studded leather kirtle. Fire up the wizard van. It's about to get weird. Welcome to Swords Against Madness, an experimental fusion of solo tabletop role-playing game and psychedelic weird fantasy fiction. I'm playing Swords and Wizardry, a recreation of the original 1974 through 1978 rules of Dungeons & Dragons, combined with solo gaming tools like the Mythic Game Master emulator. I play the game, and then I turn it into a weird, pulpy story for your enjoyment. There are no re-rolls or special rules to protect the characters. Just the dice and a fair-minded GM. And while I'm looking to create something like the weird, twisted science fiction and fantasy of the 1970s, I'm going to keep it PG, or at least what passed for PG when I was a kid in the 80s. If you didn't see it in Goonies, Gremlins, or Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, you won't hear about it here. But that's enough talk. It's time to get weird. Welcome back to Swords Against Madness. Before I get into too much action, there's a lot of housekeeping we have to do to keep the campaign rolling. For their first time since robbing Kalmak, the player characters have returned to civilization after adventuring, and that means there was a lot of experience points to split. Between the Gorum that we buried, the robots we used to fight the Gorum, the few Gorum that we engaged directly, Shoss the Lizardman, and a horde of over 5,000 gold pieces, my player characters are suddenly flush with XP, and because of the unfortunate death of Olan, I'm only splitting it two ways. A lot of podcasts like mine choose not to keep track of experience points. They tend to do things like level up characters after so many sessions. But as I'm trying to do a throwback to a very old form of D&D, I wanted to be sure to use the XP system. I'm also not in a really big hurry to level up. As it is, I find that low-level characters and low-level play can be fun, especially if you do them and make them either weird enough or wild enough. Between hot-wiring spaceships, immortal foes, and escaping orbital barrages, I feel like level 1 was quite a ride for Miria and Rhea as it is. But after everything is tallied, and bonuses for high ability scores are factored in, Miria sits at 3,499 experience points, and Rhea at 2,636 enough for them both to reach second level. For those of you familiar with old school D&D, you probably think of saving throws as five different numbers. Save versus death and poison, save versus paralysis and petrification, save versus wands, save versus dragon breath, and save versus spells. When Matt Finch created Swords and Wizardry, 
That safe harbor that Osric and several other old school games had established wasn't quite there. They weren't sure just how far they could go simulating old school rules. As a way to make sure that he wasn't perfectly copying D&D rules, Matt Finch grabbed saving throws from an older system, Chainmail, the war game that Dungeons & Dragons evolved out of, where every character had a single saving throw they had to roll over. For Swords & Wizardry, characters have one saving throw that they have to roll over on a d20, and their class gives them bonuses for saves against certain things to give them a, at least one particular strength. For Myria, this means that because she has radiation poisoning, her hit points don't go up. Her saving throw goes from a 15 to a 14. The only other thing she gets is one extra first level spell per day, and one first level spell to add to her spell book. In Myria's case, I grabbed Light. It's not the most dramatic spell or the most glamorous, but it definitely has practical uses. The last thing I want is for her to be lost in the dark. Being a fighter, Rhea's saving throw drops from 15 down to 14, giving her a pretty high survival rate for saving throws. On top of that, I rolled a d8 for hit points, and she now has a maximum of 8 hit points, which is very respectable for second level. She's gone from feeling a bit like a glass cannon to actually feeling like the heavy hitter she is. And in the few days of downtime that I've given my player characters since the last adventure, I've set her up with a suit of high-tech composite armor that works almost as well as plate mail and is slightly lighter, giving her a very respectable armor class of 16 without a shield. I gave Miria and Rhea five days of downtime to bury Olan and pay their respects, find a safe place to stash their gold, modify the composite armor that they had taken off of Shosk and a couple of other Trossi agents into something Rhea could wear, and then recruit some new NPCs. This also provided me an opportunity to make some adjustments to the game. I've purchased the recent 2023 edition of Mythic Game Master Emulator, which is a thoroughly more advanced version given that it had almost 19 years of development time between the two editions. I feel like it's going to give me a lot more options when running my solo game to make it feel more like the kind of game I would run for myself. And of course, with so much downtime, one of the first things I had to do is ask myself, how do I keep up the pressure? And the obvious answer is to ask, would Miria's radiation poisoning start playing havoc with her body? To answer that, I reset my chaos factor to 5, and then said it as very likely that Miria would suffer some kind of symptoms of the radiation poisoning. And as usual, Mythic had surprises for me. In this case, I got an extreme no, which was quite surprising. Rolling on the event meaning table, I got Hinder Depletion, which suggested to me that someone has found a way to slow the progress of her disease. As a follow-up, I asked, did Miria find a way to hack the medkit so it worked on humans again? And the answer was no. Mythic recommends you stop and go over your notes or take a break when you come across a point where you just don't know how things are possible. I sat down and I re-listened to the early episodes, and that's when I finally got the idea. It struck me like lightning. Let me tell you how. Miria worked slowly, methodically, Sealing the various cuts she had made in the nanofiber suit, she was certain it would fit Rhea. She had a holographic reference of her body to work with, but even a small flaw could weaken the armor in terrible ways. And she wasn't exactly an expert weaponsmith. Not much of a seamstress either, but she got by. She'd spent so much of her early life in luxury that it had been a rude shock to her when she became a spacer on her own and found she needed to mend her own clothes, even build her own clothes, because you didn't always have a fabricator that could make exactly what you want. Here on this primitive planet, she was proud of her skills, although they were probably pretty feeble still compared to some narish seamstress who had to use real needle and thread. And then there was the other reason she had to go slow. Her hands kept shaking. There was numbness, tingling. It was clear that her nerves were starting to be affected. She put down the sealant torch for a minute and rubbed her palm, trying to quell the paresthesia. That's when a shadow fell across her. A young woman was standing in the doorway. Lady Miria. No, don't call me that. I'm nobody's lady. The young woman froze, trying to figure out what to call her. Miria will do. Captain Okano, if you absolutely must be a formal. Okay, Miria. I don't know if you remember me or not. My name's Nala. I'm afraid I don't recognize you. My sister and I, we took turns tending to your wounds. I kept the nighttime watches over you. My sister did the daytime watches. 
when you were, you know. Miria nodded and affected a reassuring smile. She didn't really want company right now. What can I do for you, Nala? It's more what I can do for you. Uh, well, I guess it's... I guess it's also... Go on. I'm listening. I wanted to apologize and make amends. My sister and I, we were both in the crowd. My sister was up on the stage with you when the Gorum attacked. Funny, that seems like a lifetime ago. For me, it's just the most important thing that's happened in the last week. Look, my sister and I, we both ran when monsters came to take you. And we both feel ashamed for that. I've spent the last couple of days scouring every record, every note we have, every bit of lore the star people left us. And I think I have something that might help you. Nala reached into a pouch at her side and produced several small packets. What is it? It's medicine of a sort. <sighs> Under normal circumstances, we'd consider it a poison, but apparently it helps with this disorder you have. I'm afraid taking it will not be pleasant. What should I look out for? How should I take it? You'll have to have it as a tea regularly for a few days. It's going to make you very sick, but then it will make you feel better. Look, I want to fix things between you and me. Fix things with the Star Gods, too. Make up for running when my patient was in danger. Nobody in the galaxy expects medics to stand and fight when their patients are being threatened. We expect it here. Miria paused, a genuine kind smile finally melting through the icy fake one. Okay, what else do I need to know? I'm going to swear an oath to you that I will stick with you until you are better. I know that you think you can find a cure. Let me tend to you until you find it. You do realize that I'm still on the move. I'm going to be doing dangerous things and going to dangerous places. Looking after me isn't going to be like walking an invalid up and down the beach. I understand. Miria smiled and accepted the packet. Hours later, as she fought through the shaking and the vomiting, the pounding of her head as her body purged a significant amount of dangerous radioisotopes. She managed, with a sickly smile, to look at her and say, Yeah, you're hired. Hello, I'm your anchorman Toby Damped, here to tell you about Transreal News. What's this? You need to tell them about Transreal News? Clee, I I'm in the middle of something here. I think it's a wonderful idea, explaining exactly what we do here, Toby. Uh, thank you, Walter, but I'm trying to do this live. Oh, that's simply marvelous, Toby. That gives me an opportunity to steal the screen from you. Clee, shouldn't you be working on your advisories? We do have a broadcast to do in just a few minutes. Well, doesn't that make the timing a little difficult on your part, Toby? Well, it wouldn't be if I didn't keep getting interrupted. I just want to tell people about Transreal News. Ha! Huh. Foolish, primitive! I can tell you exactly what Transreal News is. It's a show where a bunch of shills and liars create a podcast trying to tell people what's going on ever since reality broke down and time and space became distorted. Shills? Liars? I resemble that remark, darling. I will run you through, Maxwell. Promises, promises, Torg. Listen, guys, this is important. We tell people about rampaging time barbarians. We will conquer. Lockdowns in hell. The televistic slime that's slowly eating the newosphere. Sure, we have to run ads and look out for what the authorities tell us to say and not to say. But that doesn't mean we're not valid journalists. Here, here, Toby. Somebody's got to warn them about the strange reality storms coming in. Or the rampaging monsters across Australia. Or, or... Or the ultra-violent time barbarians trying to murder their own ancestors to make themselves stronger? Do not speak of which you don't understand, fool. That's enough, guys. For crying out loud, I'm trying to look professional here. Sorry, Toby. <clears throat> Tune into Transreal News for the most important news, advisories, and forecasts for people traveling the astral plane and beyond. Anywhere where you get your finest podcasts. I swear, this medicine might be working, or she might be killing me. To hide that feeling of shame she was talking about. Nah, 
If she wanted to kill you, she would have given you something far quicker. She wants to torture you. Ugh, don't make me laugh. This armor you've made for me, it fits like a glove. How did you manage? Rhea took another pleased turn in the composite armor. A black, hex-patterned, skin-tight suit covered in pale white plates of a composite of ceramic, metal leaf, and energy-dissipating gels. Her movements were practically balletic. Where'd you learn to make armor like this? I had to learn to make my own gear, including my own spacesuits when I was traveling. I've had to pick up a lot of skills over the years. Rhea assessed her. That's not the first time you've used the phrase over the years with me. How old are you? You don't look a day over 25. Ugh, I told you not to make me laugh when I'm sick. I'll take that as a high compliment. I'm 175 years old. What? How do you look so young? The medicine where I come from is very advanced. It, it's not just mixing herbs. We have machines we can put inside someone's body to fix injuries, to slow decay. Most people live six or seven hundred years these days. Why? How old are you? I'm 19. What? You're only... Ugh. Planets like this confuse me so badly sometimes. Yeah, I think we better change the topic. Too much talk of age and medicine are probably bad luck anyway. What's our next move? Our first move hasn't changed. We have to wake the all-knowing. This isn't healing me, it's buying me more time. And if it has a way of defeating the Gorum, all the better. The next step in that move is to get the Order of the Stars to take us to it. And this time we go by dropship. And if they want you to wait or go through an initiation or something? I don't have that kind of time. Neither do you, neither does this village. I'm sick of all the spiritual leaders of this community leaving people out to dry. This is a time to act. If they won't tell me, I will make them. And I have a 40-ton armed dropship that can help me do it. Rhea nodded. That sounds like a plan. At this point, it became really important to me to know exactly what it is the Order of the Stars wants to do. I started by asking the Mythic GM emulator, do they regret that Myria was attacked right on their doorstep? I figured that as a religious order, they have to have at least some sense of a moral center and of hospitality. So I made that very likely and got a yes. Then I decided to figure out exactly what they did think of Myria. And that is easily done with an NPC reaction roll. Given that Myria has helped the community, and that she is indeed from space and does know the secret words, I decided to give her a plus two on the roll. It was a surprisingly low roll of five, plus two made it seven. So the Order of Stars is at best neutral towards Myria. They have no idea if she is lying, telling the truth, or just mistaken. But one way or the other, she has shaken the beliefs of the community to the core, and that is something that they aren't very happy with. It was obvious to me that they were going to have to reach out to her somehow and make sure she managed to get to them on their terms. But before I had her approached by their agent, I wanted to recruit some NPCs. Nala was the first one I rolled up, a first level druid. Nala has a strength of 10, an intelligence of 9, a 13 in wisdom, a 6 in dexterity, a 9 in constitution, and a 12 in charisma. She also has a whole whopping 2 hit points. Given how the dice have been treating me, an undersized party doesn't seem like a very good idea, so I rolled up a couple of more characters. One of them I rolled up had a strength of 9, intelligence 13, wisdom 12, dexterity 11, constitution of 8, and a charisma of 15. There was only one thing to do with this guy, and that was to make him a magic user. And given his high charisma, I could see him being a spokesman for his order. Once again, the dice have provided me with an almost perfect solution to my problem. I'll leave the third character till a little later. Let's meet our mage with a gift for Gab. Captain O'Connor. Uh, pardon me, Captain O'Connor. Miria stared up at the young man, a little bewildered at first. She'd been dozing on the sand and lost track of time. For a moment, she wasn't sure where she was or what she was doing, that someone was calling her that. The splash of seawater against her toes helped her realize where she was. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to disturb you. That's quite all right. You are? Edric Ilnari is the name. Pleased to meet you. I tried to get through to you yesterday, but my cousin Rhea wouldn't let me see you. She said you were quite ill at the time. I, I hope you're doing better. I'm doing a little bit better, thanks. You wanted to see me for something? Yes, yes, I, I arrived yesterday morning. 
The Order of the Stars sent me from the High Tower. They wanted me to start by extending our apologies. We have no idea why no one was watching the road, and none of us expected Mormont to turn... Well, he left the Order some time ago, you understand, and we hadn't been keeping tabs on him. Nobody expected him to try something like that. We all consider ourselves in disgrace after what happened to you. The High Celestine himself was going to come, but I'm afraid he's wrapped up in other matters at the moment. I'm sorry you had to wait. I'm afraid that my medication has left me feeling a little weak. No, no. I'm at your service, not the other way around. We do things at your pace from here on in. I've been sent to serve as your valet until you're ready to visit the Order of Stars, to make sure nothing like that happens again. And once you're ready, I'll help you perform the proper ceremonies and initiations so that you can go to the Fane of the All-Knowing and wake him up. I take it you can take me to the Fane of the All-Knowing? Yes, of course. I've beheld the All-Knowing myself. I was taken to the Fane myself and studied its mysteries after I was initiated into the first constellation. Perfect. Rhea! Darn it, Edric. I told you to wait until Miria was ready. He better have been polite, Miria. Do I drag him into the jungle or toss him into the sea? Easy, cousin, easy. No, no, nothing like that. It's just that he can take us to the Fane. How quickly can you wrangle up supplies? I've got most of what I need already. I'm just waiting on a few arrows and some extra jerky. I also was considering hiring a little extra muscle. There's someone I have an eye on. I could be ready to fly the day after tomorrow at dawn. Now hold on a minute. There is protocol we have to observe. There are initiations to be performed. You don't want to go in there without a proper escort. Are you my valet or my babysitter? Rhea put a heavy hand on Edric's shoulder. I promise you, I am your valet. I will go where you go. But the Fane, it's full of traps and magical wards. Going there without the proper preparations, it would be dangerous. And if I went through the proper channels, how long would it take? Well, given that you already know more about the arcane arts than almost everyone in the Order, and that you are from the stars, I'm sure people would be willing to rush it. We just have to observe the right alignments, uh, perhaps in a month? Miria pulled back a sleeve and held up a shaking hand. She gestured to a patch of petechia that dotted the pale underside of her arm. Do I look like I have a month? No. No, I suppose you don't. All right, then. I'll take you. Rhea squeezed his shoulder, causing him to wince for a moment, then slapped him on the back. Glad you're with us, cousin. Get anything you might want from town. I can lend you gold if you need it. We fly at dawn on Sweet Morn. Wait, did you just say fly? Thank you so much for listening to Swords Against Madness. I apologize this episode came a week late. I'm afraid I suffered a complication while recovering from surgery and didn't have as much time to work on it as I thought I would. You can expect the next episode in three weeks, on December 28th. In the new year, I'm hoping to accelerate to a slightly faster schedule with Swords Against Madness. But for now, let's assume that I'll have to keep the three-week schedule for a little while yet. I also wanted to let you know about two role-playing games I've released in the past month. The first is a preview version of Undead Wood Weird West RPG. While it isn't the final version, it is a complete and playable role-playing game set in my own weird fantasy world of Wonkatonkwa County. I have another podcast, Dead Man's Dice, that covers the events of my Weird West setting and campaign. I use a lot of the same storytelling techniques. But as it's being played with a cousin of mine and two of my best friends, it gets far weirder and far more wild than anything I could create on my own. And I have released my own OSR clone, Heroes and Homelands. Heroes and Homelands is optimized for copy and pasting and easy customization. I wanted it to be the basis for any homebrewed campaign I have from here on in. Sitting completely in the Creative Commons, you can copy it, Paste it and edit it however you need to to build your own old-school renaissance game. You can find that one on itch.io. Heroes and Homelands is pay what you want. And if you're looking to hack together your own rule set, I hope you'll strongly consider downloading it for free and giving it a try. I would also like to take a moment to read a listener review. This one's from JWAR5, who writes, Weird and Wonderful. This podcast is awesome. If you two miss the science fantasy of old D&D settings, Swords comes through, adding just enough spaceship-flying futuristic fun to keep things interesting. Love it. 
Side note, if you get tired of voicing all those characters, there's plenty of us out here willing to help out. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much, JWAR5. I really appreciate it. If anyone's looking to collaborate, I would love to have more voice talent on the show. Drop me an email. Swords Against Madness was written, directed, played, and GM'd by Brian C. Rideout. Editing and production was done by Stormhead Productions, which is also Brian Rideout. I have generated the music in this series using the Suno AI. For show notes and more information, visit swordsvmadness.stormheadproductions.ca. You can reach me on X at swordsvmadness. And you can email me at swordsvmadness at stormheadproductions.ca. And until next time, roll high, play hard, and think weird.